So the basic particle setup consists of four nodes. First of all, we need a root. In this case, we're going to go for particle root. We're going to connect that to the root of the scene. Now, particle root will be responsible for basic rendering properties of particles. So basically here we can set particle allowance, pre-roll and emission settings. I think of it as a hub for everything else to come when it comes to particles. Since particles is quite a big subject here in Notch, everything related to particles will be color coded orange and will be connected to this particle root. So the next step would be to add some kind of an emitter. The one we want now is a primitive emitter and a renderer, point renderer. If I hit space, I see my particles already spawning and working. Let's focus on these two nodes and let's talk about their properties and variables. So primitive emitter is responsible of defining how the particle emission shape looks like. In this case, it's a sphere. We could actually change it to a box. And if I hit space again, I see that our particle system becomes a box. We have quite a few other options here too, but I think I'm going to stick with a sphere. If you want to reset your playhead, all you have to do is press home. Or if you're using a laptop, that would be FN and arrow key back. You can actually do that in Notch UI as well. Just press this first button right here. Not only it sets the uh, emitter type, it actually sets the particle life as well. So default is five seconds. We're going to come back to that and change as we progress. And here we can set particle count as well. So the default state is 30,000. There's particle number or num particles here in the particle root as well. So why do we have two places where we count particles? In a primitive emitter, and this is where you set specific numbers of particles you want to see on the screen. And in a particle root, you set an approximate number of particles that you anticipate you will be using. Uh, let's talk a bit about point renderer. So if I zoom in a little bit closer, I see that all my particles are little quads. We can change a shape of this particle by bringing in some sprites to our resources or by building some of our own. Uh, we can use any and all generators to build sprites. For instance, I can grab a star generator and connect it to the first input of the point renderer. All of these particles are in a sprite of a star. But I think the better choice would be to build a round particle. So let's go for gradient. Let's connect it to the very same input. I see it's working, great. I'm gonna press on the preview in the viewport so we can actually see it better. Instead of mode linear, I want this to be mode radial. And I want to increase the inner range. Now we have a circle. Perhaps I should make it a little bit smaller. So 0.9 on scale X, Y, Z. Now we have a circular sprite. Again, you can bring in your own. Uh, I would suggest using something like PNG or DDS files. But generally, in most of the cases, you probably will be able to build a sprite out of the generator. So let's talk about a couple of more properties in point renderer. Uh, in this case, it's set to a blend mode linear. We can always set it to additive or any other, but I think I'm going to stick around with the default linear. Important setting here would be size randomness. As I increase size randomness, all of a sudden this setting looks a little bit more dynamic, but there's a little gotcha. Notice what happens if I increase the size randomness above the numeric value of one then we see less particles on the screen. So the smallest particles are so small that they're not even rendered on the screen. But we are still taxed by a system for the number of particles that we have set here in a primitive emitter. We definitely do not see 30,000 particles here, but we do pay a price of 30,000 particles. Very big advice here is to never exceed a setting of 0.9. As soon as you go above one, you actually pay for particles that you do not see on the screen. We do have particles. They are spawning in a sphere. They have a circular sprite, but they have no uh, animation of their own at all. Let's add one more node. Let's add an effector. So effector defines how particles animate. I think I'm going to start with turbulence. So I'm going to connect it to the particle root. And as soon as I do that, I see that my particles came alive. I think I'm going to increase the velocity amount because I want them to spread out a little bit further and a little bit faster. So this is already more exciting, but I think we could uh, push the setting a little bit further 
uh, I propose we use Life Color Shader. A Life Color Shader consists of a gradient of four colors, and these four colors appear on the particle system throughout the span of particles' lives, so from the birth to death. Let's set some kind of a gradient. Yeah, something like that. There we go. We have shaded particles that has behavior and that has a circular sprite. Now, we're not bound to use just one effector and one render per particle system. We can actually use quite a few. And if you check the list, we have quite a few effectors. And if we go to rendering, we have quite a few renders as well. So with that said, I think I'm going to grab Geometry Connection Render and I'm going to connect it to the particle root. As soon as I do that, I see that my particle system has a little triangles. That's great, uh, but that's not necessarily the thing that I wanted to happen. So I'm going to go for Geometry Connection Render and I'm going to tick off Draw Triangles, but I'm going to expand the Lines bracket and I'm going to enable the lines. Perhaps lines could be a little bit less intrusive, so I'm going to decrease the alpha. 0 0.3 seems to be a good setting. And I'm going to tick on Use Vertex Colors, because I do want this to follow the colors that are given by Life Color Shader. But I think our point render is a little bit hard to read, so in a point render, I think I'm going to add a little bit more uh, on the particle size. One more setting that I haven't mentioned in the point render, which comes quite handy, is motion blur. We can always add a little bit of motion blur. Great, so let's add curl noise. In essence, it's very similar to turbulence effector. Uh, I think I'm going to decrease the fluid simulation speed to 0 0.2. I'm going to give a, a lot of curl though, so I want a big noise here, so maybe 150. Oh, it's definitely working. It's not looking pretty, but it is working. I think the noise size could be smaller, so I'm going to set 0 0.2 there. Ah, now we're talking. This is looking a little bit more interesting. Right, so now we used two renderers and two effectors. Although we do have only one primitive emitter, we actually can have several emitters. I'm just going to grab a new one. So now we have two but they behave and look exactly the same. Let's space them out a little bit more so we see them better. Uh, well, we can address how they look and how they behave separately. We are not obliged to connect all the particle related things just to the particle root. We can actually connect them to the emitters as well. I think I'm going to give geometry connection renderer to this first one. And I think I'm going to give the point renderer to the second one. So, one of the emitters now is expressed with the lines and the other one is expressed with dots. All of a sudden they start to look a little bit different. Actually, if we grab the life color shader and add it to one, copy it out and add it then to the second one, but add another type of gradient, they will start to look reasonably different. So now they do look different, but they still behave quite the same. So I'm going to split the effectors too. So Turbulence will go to the first primitive emitter, and the Curl Noise will go to the second one. Why is it handy sometimes to connect specific effectors and renderers to uh, emitters? I'm going to grab the Curl Noise Fluid effector, I'm going to make the radius of it quite small. So notice its position when it's connected to the primitive emitter. And now notice how the position changes when I connect it to the particle root. All of a sudden it jumped to the center, so I'm going to press Alt-G so we see the grid. And now it jumped to the space or the location of the primitive emitter. So all of a sudden, if you connect a specific effector to an emitter, emitter's location becomes effector's center position too. So if you're working with something like uh, interactive settings where you have tracking happening like black tracks or motion capture suit or even if you're using uh, something like Windows Touch, you probably want to connect everything to the primitive emitter. So as you are moving the emitter, all the effectors has the same type of motion. Anything connected specifically to the emitter inherits emitter's location and rotation. 
Okay, let's talk about useful tips. In this case, we have two emitters. Both of them are drawing 30,000 particles. In the particle route, we have allowance of 64. So there's plenty to go around, but look what happens if I reduce the particle numbers here in the route. One of the particle systems uh, has just less to go about. When you're building your systems, and if you're using several emitters, or if you bump the particle numbers in a specific emitter to a bigger number than a default given in the particle route, always make sure to flush those numbers out. So if it's 30,000 here, 30,000 here, I definitely need 64,000 to have an equal amount of particles on both.